I'm glad once again that you've chosen to worship with us today. Christmas is all about surprises, is it not? Um, adult kids travel home for the holidays, make a surprise visit to mom and dad. Kids wake up on Christmas morning, they're surprised by the gifts and the toys that are under the tree. Parents wake up in January and they're surprised by the credit card bill that comes, right? <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so all of us are surprised. My, my parents had their own little surprise tradition that we did every year at our house. And so when I was growing up, I have a twin brother and a younger sister. And so we would wake up on Christmas morning and we would go out and the gifts would be under the tree and, and we would open up the gifts and we would take the time and open up the gifts. And uh, mom and dad would look at us and say, do you like your gifts? And, and we say, yeah, we liked our gifts. And they would sit there and pause. And then they would say, oh, we forgot one more gift. And then every year they would bring out the big surprise gift of the year. And so one year I got a bicycle and I remember another year I got golf clubs and as I got older, I got my first set of theological books. I, was, I think I was like six or seven and got my first <laughs> set of theological books. But um, I'm amazed at my gullibility because every single year I was caught off guard by the surprise. You would think that after four years or after five years I would have caught on, okay, there's another gift somewhere else. But, but I didn't catch on and, and they surprised us every single year. I was never smart enough to figure out their strategy. As I was thinking about that, I remembered that 35 years ago tomorrow, I did the exact same thing to Vicki. So 35 years ago tomorrow, we had just started dating, and she was over at our house for Christmas, and we gave our Christmas gifts. Is that right? We hadn't just started. Oh, we hadn't started. We'd been, oh, that's right. That's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, if I tell the story right. Yeah. Actually, we'd been dating a couple of years. There you go. Thank you. Because it was on that day I messed up that I said, after all of the gifts, I said, oh, I forgot one. And I pulled out a little box and I asked her to marry me 35 years ago tomorrow. And she said yes, and miraculously, she's still with me 35 years later. As you study the biblical story of Christmas, Christmas, the biblical story, is all about surprises. Mary was surprised by the angel's announcement that she was gonna be pregnant and have a child. Joseph, no doubt, was surprised when Mary came to him and said, wouldn't you have loved to have been privy on that conversation? When Mary sat down and said, Joseph, I gotta tell you something. And Joseph was surprised by Mary's announcement that she was pregnant. They both were surprised as they arrived in, in the city of Bethlehem and the city was overcrowded and there was no place for them to stay and they had to spend the night in a stable. Wise men were surprised by the size and the magnificent magnificence of the star. And the shepherds, as we'll see in just a few moments, were surprised by the angelic concert that they received that night. Christmas is about surprises. The past few weeks, we've been developing the theme here at Hollywood Community Church. Some of you have been here, and some of you are, are here honoring us with your presence today, but we've been developing the theme, don't just do Christmas, but be Christmas. And, and we're challenging us individually and challenging us as a church family what it would look like if we did Christmas different this year. If we didn't just do Christmas, but we actually lived out the principles of Christmas. In the past few weeks, we've talked about what it means to worship fully. And we talked about the fact that worship is not something we just do on Sunday morning, but worship is something that should encapsulate our lives 24-7. Every day of the year, we should live a life of worship. Pastor Jose brought a great message on giving generously. And Christmas is all about giving. It began with God who gave us as Brad talked about the greatest gift, his son, Jesus Christ. 
Brad then brought a great message last week where he talked about to be Christmas means to love everybody, to love all. What if we lived out those ideals, not just in the month of December, but we lived out those ideals every day of the year? Today, though, we want to take just a step back from those ideas, ideals. We want to take a step back from what it means to be Christmas, because before you can be something, you must truly believe it. You can't be Christmas until you believe in Christmas. You can't be Christmas until you believe in the Christ of Christmas. That's what we're seeing in Luke chapter 2, which is our passage today. If you want to open up your Bibles, we're going to spend a few moments in Luke chapter 2. We'll put a few verses up on the screen. As Luke 2 begins, you know the story. And by the way, I would encourage you the next couple of days, whether it's today or tomorrow, to gather your family around and take just a few moments and read this Christmas story just to put in perspective what is really important But as Luke begins this chapter, the narrative, he tells us about a governmental decree, and you know the story, which forced uh, Jesus' family to travel back to Bethlehem, to travel back to their city of origin to be counted. This necessitated that Joseph and Mary, who was just about nine months pregnant, make make an arduous journey back to the small town of Bethlehem because of the census. The town was extremely crowded and there was no place for them to stay. And Mary delivers her first child, the Christ child, there in a stable with animals all around her. After his birth, she tightly wraps him with cloth strips. Luke calls it swaddling clothes and lays him down in a manger, lays him down in an animal trough. Luke's account then moves several miles outside of Bethlehem to the Judean hillside. And and we find shepherds out in the field, Luke says, keeping watch over their flocks at night, watching the sheep. Let me just pause for a second because through the years we've kind of sterilized our account of what is taking place here. And we have this romantic novelty of what these shepherds or who these shepherds were and what they were like. But it's important for us to realize that in New Testament times, shepherds were shunned and ostracized. As a matter of fact, if they would have came in our service today and they might have sat down in the row that you're sitting in, you might have just stood up and moved over just a few seats. Why is that? Well, because shepherds were physically dirty. They, they smelled like sheep. And so as they walked in, they wouldn't have had perfume on. They wouldn't have smelled good. They would have smelled like sheep. They were physically dirty but they were also ceremonially, ceremonially, they were spiritually impure. They could not participate in religious ceremonies like you and I are participating in today. The life of a shepherd was monotonous. Every day was the exact same thing. You say, Brian, what was their schedule? Here was their schedule. They watched the sheep, they fed the sheep, they took the sheep to get something to drink, and then they went to bed. The next day, they watched the sheep, they fed the sheep, they gave the sheep something to drink, and they went to bed. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, the life of a shepherd was monotonous. But on this night, The night that Luke is narrating here in Luke chapter 2, on this night they had had rounded up the sheep, They they had built a fire, they were sitting underneath the Judean sky, maybe they were telling stories, maybe they were telling jokes, maybe they were singing songs. They were living their life just like they had done hundreds of nights before, when all of a sudden the unexpected happens. The angel of the Lord appears to the shepherds, and God's glory blazed around them. And the angel makes a simple statement. The angel says, don't fear, don't be afraid, 
For I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for everyone, which will be for all people. And the angel goes on to tell them that on that very day, in the city of Bethlehem, a Savior was born. And the angel uses two words to describe the Savior, two words that you and I are familiar with. The the first word is the Greek word Christos, which is a Savior who is Christ, the Christ, translated throughout the New Testament. It's the same word that we use for Messiah. And so the angel tells them that on this day a Savior had been born who is the Christ, the Messiah. Then he uses a second word, the Greek word kurios, which is the word Lord. And he tells those shepherds that not only had a baby been born, but the Messiah, the Christ, the Lord, had been born in Bethlehem. In other words, here's what the angel told those shepherds that night. This is no ordinary child. And then he tells them where and how to find the baby. No doubt while the shepherds were still reeling from that announcement. I mean, it wasn't common for an angel to show up. God had been silent for 400 years. There had been no angelic appearance. There had been no prophetic voice for 400 years. And out of the blue, God chooses a bunch of shepherds, dirty, stinky, smelly, ceremonially impure shepherds out in the field to give this great announcement. And if that wasn't all, Immediately, the text says that an angelic choir appears in the sky and begins to sing, glory to God in the highest, and among those, and peace among those with whom he is pleased. Isn't that a great story? That's the Christmas story. That is, that is God's story of redemption for us. Let me just give you a couple of truths from that that we can kind of chew on for just a few minutes and put in our mind and put in our heart and maybe something that will make you think today, something that the Holy Spirit of God will use to penetrate your heart. The first thing I want you to see is this. The shepherds were surprised by belief. They were surprised. Now, now catch this. You know this. The shepherds weren't out in the fields reading their Bibles. They weren't going through that night all the messianic prophecies expecting the angel to appear to them that night. They hadn't been exegetically studying the scriptures. They hadn't been systematically and strategically looking through the dates and realizing that there was a good chance that on this night the the Savior would be born There's no evidence to indicate that they believed that the Messiah was going to show up anytime soon or maybe at all. These shepherds were living their ordinary lives, watching sheep, feeding sheep, watering sheep, going to bed day after day, week after week, when all of a sudden, in the midst of the ordinary, Catch this, the extraordinary happens. In the midst of the natural, something supernatural happens. Let me pause for a second and ask you a question. Isn't that just like God? Isn't that like God to do that in our lives? In the midst of normal or in the midst of the normal events of life, God shows up. Can you pause for a second? Has God ever done that in your life? I mean, you were in the routines of life. You got up, you got your coffee, you went to work, you worked eight to 10 hours, you went home, you were tired, maybe flipped on the TV for a couple of hours, went to bed day after day, week after week, and all of a sudden, in the midst of the ordinary, God shows up in your life. And God does something completely unexpected. God demonstrates his power in your life and in mine. If you're following along in your notes, I made just a couple of subpoints 
The first is this, belief is initiated by God. Man, this is such an important point. Catch this. Belief is initiated by God. In our day and age, we want to flip all of that. In our day and age, we want to think that belief is the result of a long search for truth. The the idea that we think is this, man, a person sits down and says, man, I'm going to study all of the facts. I'm going to examine all of the rational evidence, and I'm going to come to certain conclusions, and I'm hoping that conclusion is a belief in God. There are times that that happens. Have you ever read a book Lee Strobel wrote called The Case for Christ? Lee Strobel was, was a reporter for one of the newspapers in Chicago and sat back and said, you know what, I want to study, I want to disprove this theory of Christ. And he went through and examined all the facts, and Lee Strobel became a believer and has written all kinds of books. But many times that doesn't happen The vast majority of the time, God shows up in someone's life when they don't expect it, when they're not looking for God, when they're not searching for the truth. As a matter of fact, the Bible is filled with accounts of individuals who were living their normal lives, and God shows up. Abraham was living in Ur of of the Chaldees, a pagan and God shows up in his life. If you read Luke chapter 24, you read the story of the men who were traveling back from Jerusalem. We call it the road to Emmaus. After Christ's death, they were traveling back from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They didn't know that Jesus had risen from the dead, and they were talking among themselves about Christ. And how was it that, man, we thought this was the Messiah, when all of a sudden a man shows up and begins walking with them. And a man walks with them for the majority of the trip. They had no idea that it was Jesus who was walking with them. And when Jesus finally revealed himself to them, they made the statement, man, didn't our hearts burn within us? In the midst of the ordinary, God did something extraordinary in their lives. Maybe the greatest apostle of the New Testament, the apostle Paul, was not searching for God. As a matter of fact, Paul thought that he had already found him, and Paul was against this this new religion called the way, and he was persecuting believers. As a matter of fact, he was on the way to Damascus to arrest more believers, when all of a sudden, what happens? God shows up in Paul's life, in Paul's life is never the same. We have reiterated this point over and over again the last few weeks. Faith does not begin with us. Faith does not begin with you. Faith begins with God. It is God who draws us to himself. As a matter of fact, it was Jesus who said that no man can come to the Father unless he's drawn by the Holy Spirit of God. Faith, belief is initiated by God. Let me ask you today, what is God doing in your life to draw you to himself? You might sit back and say, man, Brian, I don't have a clue. Is God even at work in my life? Yes, God is at work in your life. There is a sovereign, omniscient, omnipotent, compassionate God who is at work in your life and whose desire it is to draw you to him. And he might not do it the way that you expect, and he might not do it when you expect. As a matter of fact, you might be like the shepherd, surprised by belief. So how did God do that in the lives of the shepherds? Verse 9 of Luke chapter 2 says this, And the glory of the Lord shone around them. I wrote this simple phrase, if you're following along in the outline. I wrote this, Belief comes as a result of seeing God's glory. 
Belief comes as a result of seeing God's glory. The word glory here is an interesting word. It refers to the bright light that surrounds the very presence of God himself. In other words, these shepherds recognized that they were in the very presence of God. Glory to God in the highest. Now, listen, God doesn't always show up the same way. The Shekinah glory of God is not necessarily going to show up in in your bedroom. Don't go out to the Everglades tonight and light a fire and sit out there and wait. Or say, okay, God, I'm waiting for an angelic choir. I'm waiting for the Shekinah glory of God to show up. God doesn't always show up the same way. But I promise you this. God wants to demonstrate his glory, his power, his purpose in your life life. He might not do it like he did it to the shepherds, but he desires to do it. How will he do it? He might, he might provide comfort to you when you're broken. Go, going through one of the most difficult periods of your life, and God shows up in your life. It was C.S. Lewis who made that great statement, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pain. And it's in those moments of brokenness that God often shows up. He may provide comfort when you're broken. He may provide cash when you're broke. (laughs) He might demonstrate his glory in your life by providing a need that you have. He may give you a friend or even show himself friendly to you when you feel lonely. He may give you hope when you are hopeless. Let me ask you today, I can't answer the question in your life, how has God shown up in your life? I simply made this phrase in my notes, don't miss God's glory. Don't miss God's manifestation in your life. What if the shepherds would have sat back and said, man, you know what, we're just, we're taking care of sheep. Leave us alone. We're so busy here taking care of sheep. We don't have time for an angelic announcement. They would have missed God's glory. You see, God desires to produce faith. God desires to produce belief in your life. And God will do whatever is necessary to draw you to himself. Here's the thing, though. Often we're so focused on the ordinary that we miss the extraordinary. Often we're so focused on the natural that we miss the supernatural. God does something in our lives and we fail to realize that God showed up. You see, belief comes as a result of seeing the glory of God. There's a third thing that I wrote based upon the passage. Belief is a response to the gospel. Here, here's what the angel said. Behold, I bring you Good news of great joy, which shall be for all people. The the word good news right there, the phrase good news, comes from the word from which we get our word gospel. It's the exact same Greek word. So here's what the angel, the angel comes to those shepherds in the field. And I find it so amazing that the angel did not show up to the elite in Jerusalem. He didn't show up to the temple in Jerusalem and make this announcement to the religious leaders. But he showed up to a group of men who were shunned and ostracized and smelly and smelled like sheep and gave them the greatest announcement that this world has ever heard. And he shared the good news with them. The angel brought the gospel to the shepherds. 
You see, the simple truth is this. You cannot get away from the gospel. If you want your faith to grow, if you want your belief to grow, you must expose yourself to the message of God. You must expose yourself to the message of God's word. It was the apostle Paul who said it this way. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You sit back today and say, man, Brian, my faith is really weak. I'm not a prophet, but I would guess that you're spending very little time in God's word. You're spending more time in other pursuits of life because spending time in God's word will increase your faith. Belief comes from hearing and receiving and believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so catch this, to be Christmas then, to, to live out the principles of Christmas means it begins with the fact that I believe and I accept the gospel, which recognizes Jesus as Savior, Messiah, and Lord. Let me just pause for a second and ask you this. Have you come to that place in your life? Have you come to that place in your life where you sit back and say, man, it's not about religiosity, it's not about this, it's not about that, it's about me realizing that Jesus is who he says he is and God has showed up in my life and I believe it. Surprised by belief. There's one other thing that we see in the passage and let me mention it quickly. Not only were these shepherds surprised by their belief, but these shepherds acted on their belief. Let me just read a a couple of verses here in the chapter, in Luke chapter two, verses 15 through 17. So the angel has already come and the angel already gave them the announcement. Verse 15 says, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, And they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. Here's what I want you to catch. Please catch this today. Belief and faith are not just nouns. I'm not trying to give you a grammar lesson today. There's a purpose behind it. Belief and faith are not just nouns. They're not just something that we grab a hold of, put in our pocket, and say that we possess. Their noun-like qualities only exist if they are followed up by verb or with verb-like actions. To believe in something is to act upon that belief. 35 years ago, I looked at this beautiful lady and I said, man, I believe I'm in love with this lady. How stupid would it, be, would it have been for me to say, man, I believe I'm in love with this lady and turned around and walked away and not acted upon my belief. But I did and I, I wanted to put a picture up on the screen and we didn't get it up in time. My love for her caused me to give her this humongous quarter carat diamond that she has <laughs> on her finger right now. This humongous diamond. And I wanted her to know that I loved her and I wanted to what? Spend the rest of my life with her. I believed that I loved her but now it was time for me what? Not just to have this belief, this faith, this emotion in my heart, but it was time for me to what? To act on that emotion. And I'm so glad I did. She's given me 32 wonderful years. How long has it been? 32, 33, or 33, something like that. 33 wonderful years. Notice how the shepherds acted on their belief. They just didn't hear the message of the angel and look to one another and say, You believe that? (laughs) I believe that. Great. Now, where are the sheep, all right? Who's got some hot dogs to roast? No, 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 that's not what they did. They, they, They said, they looked at one another and said, if this is true, let us go to Bethlehem. And verse 16 says, and they went with 
haste. Haste isn't a word that we use very often. The NLT says it this way, they hurried. The Message Bible says it this way, they left running. They didn't want to wait around. They didn't want to take their time. They sped out of there, and they made a beeline for Bethlehem. Why is it? Because they believed that the Savior, the Christos, the Messiah, the Kyrios, the Lord was in Bethlehem. And they left everything to search for Jesus. They didn't allow the distractions of life to keep them from seeking Jesus. I wrote in my notes, how often is our belief thwarted by the activities of life? Yeah, the child's in Bethlehem, but I've got to take care of sheep. The child's in Bethlehem, but that's two miles away, and Uber doesn't exist yet. (laughs) We got to walk that whole way. They did not allow the distraction, the discomforts, the difficulties of life to keep them from acting on their belief. It was something that they possessed. It was real in their heart and in their life. And because they believed it, because they experienced, they said, we have to go and see this for ourselves. They acted with determination. Notice they did a second thing. I I don't know whether I've ever seen this in the passage before. They acted with conviction in the passage because verse 17 says this, and when they saw it, so they came to Bethlehem, just as the angel had said. They found the Christ child in the stable, just as the angel had said. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. That's a little bit of old English. And so I thought, what in the world does that mean? I love how the Message Bible says it. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about the child. They so much believed in what they had heard and what they had seen that they could not keep their mouth shut. Their belief caused them to tell everybody what they had seen and experienced. I know today I'm talking to people of faith. If today I, I had the opportunity, I'm not going to, it's Christmas Eve, you have activities, we have activities. But if I had the time today and ask each of you, do you possess faith today? Do you believe that Jesus is the Savior, the Christos, the kureos, the Lord, do you believe that? I would venture to say the great majority of us here today would say, yes, I believe that. How has that belief affected your life? I find it interesting that we say that we can have a relationship with the omnipotent, omniscient creator God of the universe and our life never be changed. Our life never be different. Our pursuits never change. You see, these shepherds were not only surprised by belief, but their belief completely changed the way that they lived and acted. I would love to know the story. I mean, if if this would have happened in this day and age, some of these guys would have already written a book and there would have already been a television special. And, you know, one one of the movie companies would have already written a movie about one of these guys. I would love to know the rest of the story, how their lives would change. I'd venture to say, I'd guess, pretty educated guess, that their life was never the same. Their life was completely different because they met Jesus. They believed in the Christ of Christmas. 
So my question to you today is this. Do you believe in the Christ of Christmas? I'm not asking you today whether you just have a head knowledge, whether you, uh, you, you know, have this intellectual assent. Yes, I believe that he lived. You know, Josephus tells us there's historical evidence that all of that happened. Yes, I believe. No, I'm asking you today, do you believe that he is the very son of God? Do you believe that he is the Christos, the one who came and died for your sins and provided a way for you to have access to God? Do you believe that he is Lord of lords and King of kings? Do you believe that? You see, you can't be Christmas until you believe in the Christ of Christmas. You see, quite frankly, the reason we're not making a difference in our world today is that we say that we believe something, but we're not acting out. We're not living out what we believe. We come to church, we come to Christ, and our lives are always the same. To be Christmas means that I begin to live out the principles of the gospel in my life. I not only do it because it's the right thing to do, but I do it because my life has been changed. I've met the Savior. I've met the Christ. I've met the Lord, and he is changing my life. Here's our challenge for you this Christmas. Don't just do Christmas. Next few hours, you're gonna spend time with family and friends. You're gonna eat a lot. I'm gonna eat a lot. (laughs) Gonna have a lot of fun. Look for opportunities to be Jesus Christ, to live out the principles of Jesus Christ. Let's not just do Christmas. Let's be Christmas this year. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you so much for the simplicity of the gospel. Lord, thank you that we don't have to have a master's degree to understand what you've done for us. Thank you that we don't have to earn a PhD in theology to understand the intricacies of the gospel. Thank you that you have demonstrated for us through the person of Jesus Christ who we are and who you desire for us to become. So God, right now, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts, in the heart of each and every person here. Help us to examine our hearts. Help us to turn, to believe, to have faith, in Jesus, and may that faith change us, mold us, shape us into the men and women that you want us to be, and help us to be Christmas, not just this next week, but all throughout next year. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.